I want to talk today about math in the real world. And I want to start with providing a, a reason why I think that this is an important concept. And then I want to show some examples of what, what changes you could make in your curriculum and your how you approach mathematics with your students that I think would make a big difference in, in outcomes for students. So the first point I want to bring up is that math curriculum tends to be heavily focused on a list of calculations we want students to be able to do and then we find problems related to those kinds of calculations. So for example, we want students to learn how to multiply numbers. Uh, that's our focus. And so then we find um, problems where, you know, Johnny's got six sheep, each of whom has four legs. And so therefore, how many legs of sheep do we have total? And I think one of the consequences of this kind of focus is that the students don't understand why they're learning these tools and um, they don't really get that the the tools themselves were invented by somebody. It's a whole bunch of host of problems related to this kind of focus. I think that we should start with problems. And we should start with problems which have a meaningful context for students. Some of those contexts could be from things they do in their life, which is great. Some of it could be from puzzles or games or problems. So we should start with the problem first an interesting problem ideally and then from those problems draw out different areas of mathematics and and it's really critical that we start thinking about the the big picture you know in in grammar for example so when we teach English and we we've got kids learning grammar uh, well when well, they learn grammar because it helps them become a better writer and they, they start by writing you know my kindergartner last year was writing a journal you know this is a meaningful context for him where is the equivalent in mathematics education? So the first strategy is teaching kids to be problem finders. Not just problem solvers, but problem finders. So that could be giving them multimedia, like a picture of a, um, this is a honeycomb, and ask them what's, what's something you notice, what's something you find interesting about this, you know, what are some patterns that you see in this, this relationship? Uh, and, you know, why do you think this exists? Why this particular pattern? Why not some other pattern? And maybe it's related to man-made objects like fountains and sort of say, well, there's something really interesting. There must be some sort of relationship here at play that maybe we can figure out. And, you know, some mathematical objects are, you know, direct consequence of decisions made by people. Why did they choose to make these things in this shape? Why that angle? It seems kind of strange that they're always sort of the same sort of um, the same angle, the same shape. And, you know, kids have other questions like, wow, that must have taken a long time. How long did it take? These are sort of questions you can answer with mathematics. And some things are completely abstract. But when you stare at this shape and you look at it, I think it's hard not to wonder why some of these things are circles and some are not. And what's the relationship? And I mean... If you start to play with the patterns pretty pretty quickly, you're going to see some very interesting patterns and you're going to see um, some relationships that maybe you didn't think of in this way before. The second thing is that you have to become a problem finder yourself, that you have to model finding problems for students and seeing mathematics in your world and how it relates to your students' world. So that's not not a huge task, I don't think. It, it just involves you carrying some equipment with you. What I'm showing you right now, this is what you would have done 20 years ago. Uh, today, you need a smartphone or you need um, just, you know, a notebook or something to keep track of, of things that you run into in your life that you think are good, interesting math problems. And you have to have a sort of a different lens that you use. You have to sort of look at the world through the lens of how does this problem, how, how does this thing I'm looking at relate to my students' needs? I was um, at an Ultimate Frisbee game, and uh, we're playing disc, and we're having to keep track of our score during the game, and we keep track of score with shoes. And uh, we always run out of shoes. Like, this is a consistent problem. We don't have enough shoes to keep track of our score. And I wondered how much of a relationship there was between the type of scoring system we were using and how many shoes we need. And so I started experimenting with different scoring systems and I discovered that actually binary is a really effective scoring system. 
uh, it has a different difficulty, which says that uh, nobody else understands what the score is. So you're trying to share the score with your teammates. You have to constantly be around to explain the score. So that's a, a sort of a relationship of mathematics in a social context. But it's also solving a, a real problem that I'm trying to figure out for my world. And I can share that problem with students and they'll get it, right? And they've kept score before. Some of them have played ultimate. Actually, a lot of my students have played ultimate. I, I would try to choose examples. I think that I would be in overlap with my students rather than ones where I'm sort of like this weirdo adult doing something that kids don't do. There are some resources in this area. These are teachers who are already doing this. They are collecting ideas that they've got, that they've seen, and they are keeping track of them. They're putting them online. So you can go and take a look at these resources and sort of say, oh, okay, I get it. I can do that too. I'll pick a different area. You know, I'll pick something else. Or maybe I'll pick music or I'll pick um, not visual patterns, but audio patterns or videos, etc. Something that you are used to, to curate a part of a section of resources for other math teachers. I recommend using familiar contexts. So, and this is a little joke, right? A grain silo contains a thousand kilograms of grain. I mean, the students really cannot answer that question unless they know what a grain silo is. Because they don't even know what the shape of a grain silo is. And then sometimes what happens is, you know, they draw a picture to try to make it easier to understand. Well, why not choose a context in the first place where the picture's unnecessary, where the picture's in the kids' heads already? Avoid pseudo-context. So a pseudo-context is when the context is just not does not make sense at all. So a basketball game where the team score two points every minute for the duration of the game is ridiculous. No basketball game is like that. And the second one is when the the things the kids are expected to do in the problem are not realistic according to the problem. So Mark's age is three times more than four times Mark's age. Mark age of Mark's dad is three times more than four times the age of Mark's dad. Who cares? No one cares about the answer to this because it's not we don't calculate ages this way. So here's a problem. I mean, what, take a look at this problem, pause the video if you have a chance, and read it and ask yourself, why is this pseudo-context? The next thing I think that is, we think really important for us is that we need to break down the walls between barriers. Students need to stop thinking of science and math as being separate disciplines all the time. They are slightly different lenses for looking at the world. And it's really useful if we're looking at the same world in these different lenses so that we can see what does a mathematical lens look like when we're looking at a phenomenon in the world compared to a scientific lens. We need to, to create pathways so that students can see the relationship between the science they're doing, the English they're doing, the humanities they're doing, the math they're doing. I mean, all of these courses that we've created are really fairly artificial constructs. I mean, you can see in a math class as a math teacher how much time you spend talking about language. Measure it sometime. It's huge. And learning is social. So by this I mean we as human beings have been um, trained from birth to learn through interactions with other people. We are biologically uh, designed to learn from each other. The ideal group for learning would be a multi-age peer group learning from an adult mentor in the context of doing some valuable and important task for survival in outdoors. That's what our brains are designed to learn through best. So question is, what in your classroom represents that, that, that information? And I think for most of the time we can't really do much about the outdoors all the time, but maybe you can. But we can certainly adjust the social arrangements we have in our classes in our schools. So, I mean, this is a lovely picture, but the, the technology in this classroom, the desks in this classroom are all designed to make sure that everybody's learning everything from the teacher. That means all interactions in this supposedly idealized class are being mediated through one bottleneck, the teacher. Whereas you can have a, a social environment where the kids can, you know, they're mentored, the teachers maybe even got a slightly elevated role, but there is some sort of social aspect to what they're doing and they're learning from each other. I mean, the purpose of these whiteboards is for them to share information 
and share ideas with each other more easily. The, the last point I want to bring up is if, if you're doing all the thinking in your math class, then you're doing most of the learning. And since our objective is to get our students doing most of the learning, they need to do, do more of the thinking. I'm not saying they necessarily have to do all of the thinking. I mean, there's some role for mentorship from teachers there. But they should be doing a lot more than they typically do. So one way to do this, and this is uh, from a keynote that I saw a couple years ago. Uh, Peter here is a very, very clever fellow. And he's got, he do, he's done some research. And he said, you know, kids ask basically three kinds of questions. They ask questions because you're near them. And they want to, they see a, a way of developing a relationship with you is to ask you a question and to see, and that tells you that they're thinking about what you're working on, right? They ask questions so they don't have to think anymore. So a question like that might be, am I right? That, that question, I don't know if the kids actually care, like if they answer. They don't necessarily even care what the answer is. They just want to know, can I be freed from having to think in this situation? The third kind of question is start thinking questions. And I wouldn't answer these with the answer. I would answer these with avenues of exploration. So, for example, a student might say, you know, I was looking at the stars and I noticed there's this really big clump of stars on the horizon. And I find that kind of weird. Like, why are there all these stars in this one spot? And uh, you might say, well, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if there's any better pictures of it. Maybe there's some information that, that people have about those stars that would be useful. Uh, and maybe it would be useful to draw some pictures of what do you think stars look like in space. How do they group? How are they grouped? Uh, and you might want to look into galaxies. So you've not answered their question. You have given them things they can continue to do to answer their own questions. Uh, you're welcome to share this presentation or to use portions of it if you like, provided you give me attribution.